Radil, who now became a deputy foreign minister for Subasic. Six capitalist ministers walked in and were given cabinet posts with or without portfolios. It was characterized here as a Trojan horse policy, followed by the coalition and by the Kremlin, agreed to by the Kremlin. Now, it's wrong to dismiss this as a mere episode. It marked a new stage in dual power, the emergence of a new dual power system, with the Trojan horse policy apparently in reverse. Because from all indications, the bourgeois ministers were virtual captives in Tito's cabinet. At any rate, Foreign Minister Subasic was. At the first Big Five Council meeting of ministers held in London during the Tito Subasic regime, it was attended by Cardelli, and not Subasic, who was reported from Belgrade by someone obviously with a sense of humor that he had suffered an apoplectic stroke and couldn't go. Later, Subasic almost had an apoplectic fit, denying it. In any case, Cardelli was foreign minister de jure, if not de facto, in the coalition government after Subasic and company walked in. Now, what happened then? These gentlemen whom Churchill Stalin agreed upon and Tito Cardelli admitted started filing out. By the end of October, the last two also left. Who remained behind? The one and the same party, the one and the same leaders. Now, if the original March entrance of these six capitalists was no more than an episode, it is difficult to understand why the October exit of the last two should have heralded a qualitative transformation. Namely, bringing into being a new worker state within a certain time. To put it mildly, such a point of view leaves one uh, a little irritated. What is particularly irritating is that if anything is a theoretical novelty, it's this conception of dual power being solved not through a succession of dual power systems, but through a workers' peasants' government, next a coalition government, and finally, the dictatorship of the proletariat. Three distinct types of states. Dual, capitalist, workers. Now, I'm not resolved in principle to the novelty of it. But I don't like novelties introduced, especially in theory, which had not recognized as such openly, thoroughly discussed following a theoretical motivation explanation just how this theory squares with our orthodox Marxist doctrine. I am confident such oversights will be remedied and a whole new proposal carefully reviewed. I'm considerably over the time limit already and I haven't even come to the fifth peculiarity and that is the role of the international factors in this dual power process. I must now pass, skip to the outstanding features, which in my opinion, in the light of the above theoretical motivation, lead me to conclude that a dual power system still rules over Yugoslavia. Question must naturally be answered. Where are the seats of bourgeois power? I've already mentioned the convulsive character of the regime in its policies, in its shifts, so characteristic not only of centrism, but also of dual power systems. <coughs> Let me here say that I'm sorry that some of our co-thinkers are suggesting that we redefine the character of the Yugoslav party and call it a revolutionary party with right-wing deviations. Our majority resolution does not do so. The proposed resolution, no matter what adjectives you add to it, remains a definition of the Bolshevik party of Lenin. And we cannot accept that resolution, that uh, definition. Second, you must list the peasantry. Does there exist a correlation of forces 
between the proletariat and the peasantry in Yugoslavia as permits a lasting stabilization of a single regime. You must answer the question, how did the peasants, especially the world, to do on a rich emerge from the civil war? Weaken the state. You must weigh their specific weight. Far from there being an alliance, it appears as if there's a growing rift, especially in the recent period. Behind this huge mass of private proprietors, well-to-do and rich by Yugoslav standards, there stands, of course, the power of American world imperialism. Far from an alliance with the peasantry being maintained on any stable basis, you have a situation that is further aggravated by the current threat of famine. Now, you can't just dismiss that aside. You've got to evaluate it. And you can't just evaluate it for future perspective. You must evaluate it in terms of the present and the past as well. Now, please don't let anyone go out of here saying that right apparently favors collectivization, forced collectivization in Yugoslavia, and then might be prepared to call it a worker state. I don't mean this at all. Let me give you the third seat of bourgeois power. And I hope no one will be so like-minded to deny that the peasantry in Yugoslavia is a pretty mighty lever. I'm going to, I'm going to just, I don't know. Dual power finds expression in the relationships between the bureaucracy and the party ranks between the bureaucracy and the working class as a whole. It would be a grave error to underestimate the importance of recent reforms. They show how vigorous the revolution is, how very much alive it is. But it would be an equally big blunder to exaggerate their scope and meaning. One field has remained virtually untouched by reforms, and that is the Yugoslav Communist Party. The ruling party. There is one source of bureaucratic power and privilege that remains to all intents and purposes a virtual monopoly of the bureaucracy. And that was that determines the promulgation of its policies with such ease. Parentheses. And that's no trifle. If any single factor has prevented the Yugoslav working class from fully entering the historical arena, it is this relationship between the bureaucratic tops and the ranks inside the Yugoslav party. It is this that has served as the major internal obstacle to the speed of socialist consciousness among the masses and blocked the entry of the Yugoslav party and its cadre further on the road to Trotskyism. Now, the importance of such a subjective factor, especially after what has already been said in the majority report, I don't think needs to be dwelt on. So far as I can understand, there is a tendency among the majority to evaluate the Yugoslav processes in the following way. Everything that shows a shift to the right, say that's accidental, secondary, episodic. Everything that is except the latest development, which I completely agree with uh, Comrade Weiss, only I don't think that's conclusive either. It's too early to say how conclusive that shift is. That condition may continue for a while yet. We may get, as I am confident we will, further shifts, not only to the right, but also to the left. But on the other hand, every move to the left is considered as absolutely conclusive, irrevocable. Now, you can't view either the reforms or the nationalizations, even the struggle against bureaucracy, as being definitive, as having their fate decided any more than you can view the course of the Tito regime to remain independent of both Kremlin and Washington. 
as having been decided. If you do so, you fall into a trap. And that's not at all unimportant because you can never draw historical generalizations from episodic developments. And some comrades seem to forget that to proclaim the birth of a new dictatorship of the proletariat is to draw a very important historical generalization. I have to skip the entire list of the shortcomings in the uh, majority position. One I must point out, however, and that is, can you evaluate historical results separate and apart from the leadership and program by which it is achieved? And can these historical results prove superior to that leadership and to that party? That's a very important innovation in our movement. Marx and Engels said it can be done. Lenin was just as emphatic. So was Trotsky. Before we say that a centrist leadership and program can achieve the same results as a genuine revolutionary party and program, that is a worker state, we should have all the overwhelming evidence that is needed to prove it. In conclusion, the majority formula for Yugoslavia is that of a victorious proletarian revolution, a worker state. That is also, of course, the formula of a completed revolution. Completed in the same sense and with the same results as was the Russian revolution. Our co-thinkers originally defined it as a worker state with bureaucratic deformations. That is word for word how Lenin defined the young Yugoslav Republic. Our own majority resolution doesn't even bother with such qualifications. States flatly, a worker state. That's far too sweeping. You yourself will have to modify it, even if you persist in calling it a worker state. The outstanding merit of the resolution is that it recognizes that a proletarian revolution is in occurring in Yugoslavia. And the need, not to say the enthusiasm, of intervening in it, coming to its defense, seeking to its extend its conquests, seeking to guarantee the victory. Its chief fault is that it skips over so lightly over the entire period, declares something as resolved, which is not the tall resolve, resolves it in a manner incompatible with our previous positions. The CPY and its leadership have won many important battles but they have still to win the war, the war for the proletarian dictatorship. Comrades, I want the convention to understand precisely what I am doing here. I am making what amounts to a declaration on behalf of the Johnson Forest tendency. We are not debating the issues raised by Comrade Weiss about Yugoslavia or about state capitalism, nor the swinging of the Yugoslav pendulum as described by Comrade Wright. If we were doing that, we would have presented a resolution and requested a full-time reporter. The issue that matters for us is the related question. That is, 
It is the role of Stalinism. It is expressed very simply in the document presented by us to the party. We placed it at the very beginning of that document. And I want to read it for you. On page four we said, I quote, the dilemma of the Fourth International is that it has to recognize that there now exists a labor bureaucracy which is the enemy of private property and national defense and yet is counter-revolutionary. The Fourth International cannot escape this decision. If the destruction of private property and the repudiation of national defense are revolutionary, then Stalinism is revolutionary. And there is no historical need for a fourth international. For us, all discussions are entirely subordinate to the question of the role of Stalinism. The danger is to begin with Yugoslavia and end with Stalinism as the leader of the revolution on a world scale. We made it clear from the start that it was the question of the program and the building of the party. We stated further in our bulletin, and I quote, these are the questions with which the theory of state capitalism deals. The theory is not primarily concerned with defensism or defeatism in Russia, about which we can do very little. We are primarily concerned with what the refusal to accept this theory does to the party, to its solidarity, to its capacity to fight its enemies, its capacity to preserve itself and to grow. In brief, to prepare the liquidation of Stalinism. I want to repeat, we are concerned with the building of the party. And the building of the party is above all the question of the program. In our document, we characterized the position of Pablo very sharply. We considered his position a catastrophe for the international. Now, in over a year of party discussion, neither the majority reporter, Herman Weiss, nor any other leading spokesman of the majority has dealt with Pablo. Yet that is the question it is the central problem. The reporter now emphasizes that it is his position in which he is on his own, and he says the fur can fly, that a process of elimination of capitalism is going on in the buffer zone while the real vital forces of the revolution have been crushed. That is his position. It is interesting but we do not propose to debate with him. We want an official position. We want to know where the political committee stands on this question. We want to know, and our document shows that from the beginning we wanted to know where they stand in relation to Pablo. We want to know if they agree or disagree with him. We would like to know, if they do agree, how and where they differentiate themselves from him and his 200-year perspective of degenerated worker states and the continued existence of a regenerated capitalism. We have stated that Pablo's tendency is a pro-Stalinist and liquidationist tendency. 
That we stand by. We shall make no more pronouncements in discussion in the party until we have an official document to debate against. You have known us now for some three years. You will have observed, I believe, that we are very careful in what we say and how we say it. We are going to be very careful here as we have been in the past. We told you at the last convention that we were glad that the SWP was here for us to join. After three years, our original satisfaction is not only confirmed, but in every way increased. We believe that you also have found us to be good, loyal party members. But it would be wrong to disguise the fact that if the international and the leadership of the majority of the party come to the conclusion that Stalinism can lead the revolution, that would be a very serious thing for the party and therefore a very serious thing for us. That is why, in accordance with our usual practice, we are prepared to wait and see and to know what we are debating against what is said and who says it so that we shall be able to characterize it with that care and precision which we have always exercised even in the documents we issued in our interim period our position is known no one can misunderstand it at all the basis of the left opposition the CLA the SWP, the whole Fourth International, every line that Trotsky wrote after 1933 was that Stalinism was the gravedigger and syphilis of the revolution. Not Stalinism in Russia alone, but the Communist International, and today the common form, which our comrades in Italy, in France, in China, in India, have to fight against. We still believe them to be the grave digger of the revolution. We still believe them to be the syphilis of the movement. We have posed this question consistently almost from the very start of this discussion. We got no reply. And it is for that reason that we are prepared to wait until the comrades are ready. We find that a number of comrades suddenly display an intense interest in the theoretical aspects of state capitalism. That is progressive. But for 10 years, we have been writing on the theory of state capitalism. No one said a single word about what we have written. No one has yet written a line in answer to what we have put down on paper. That is your privilege. But it is also our privilege not to debate that now. And, as a matter of fact, we could not do so if we wanted to. Debate what and with whom? We cannot debate against some remarks made by a reporter at a convention. When some authoritative person in leadership of the party writes a reply to the theoretical questions that we have raised, we can and will debate. Not today and not in place of the question whether Stalinism is the builder of the socialist society or the grave digger and syphilis of the revolution. 
We do not say that the procedure that is being followed by the party at this convention is wrong. We don't say that for one single moment. We think that under the circumstances, it is as good a procedure as is possible. We do not attack the leadership for not having a position on this question. That would be mere snipe. That kind of politics we have not engaged in and will not go in for. The leadership is absolutely correct to say that it is not prepared to take a position for the time being and the question is open until later. It cannot be said and will not be said by us that the SWP leadership <coughs> avoids taking position on political questions. What we are putting forward is our situation. What we are saying is this. A minority, and a very small minority at that, cannot discuss everything and at every time. We haven't got the forces for it. We haven't got the opportunity to do it. The party press is able to take up Yugoslavia from day to day. It is able to follow events in Korea and in Russia. It is able to take up everything that is happening in Eastern Europe or in China. In theory, we as a minority also are able to write whatever we please, as long as discussion lasts. But we cannot write a stream of documents in internal bulletins. We wear ourselves out and probably wear you out from reading them if we follow that course. You discuss one special case of exceptional circumstances today, and then you have to discuss another case of unique or exceptional circumstances. For example, I read in the press the other day that at a meeting some morning in Berlin, a Stalinist functionary stood up and declared that Eastern Germany was today a worker state. You could also read there in the press daily about others in Eastern Europe getting up to declare that their nations are now worker states with the Soviet form. No, we can't keep up with that. We have had a certain experience in discussing as a minority for many years. In fact, for some 10 years. We gain nothing from discussing in that manner. In the end, people get tired of discussion. And often before the actual core of discussion has been reached, the comrades begin to say, we have had enough of this. Everyone has said what he wants to say. It's gone on for a long time. It's time to come to a conclusion. That will not happen to us. We want it understood, not only by what we say, but by what we do, that we are discussing the nature of Stalinism and nothing else. For us, from that discussion, everything else flows. Germany and Italy were defeated. They were not victorious. By an evolutionary process, some of the uh, feudalistic features were lopped off in those countries. And then we had the definitive establishment of a bourgeois state by the unification of Italy and the unification of Germany, done partially through revolutionary wars, partially through bureaucratic actions, under the aegis of uh, uh, feudalistic politicians, uh, uh, all done under the formal aegis of the monarchy. I cite these uh, instances not to draw any analogy between the bourgeois 
revolutions or the establishment of the bourgeois state in those two countries with the course or, or to draw any pattern for the proletarian revolution and the destruction of capitalism. Because we know that the relationship of the proletariat to state power is far different than that of the bourgeoisie which grew up uh, right in the, inside the womb of feudalism and was able to build sources of power before the, uh, 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 within the fold for a while of the old uh, class system. But, but as an illustration of the variegated processes of history where this grandiose task of a new class formation was accomplished in such a startling different manner in the instances that I have cited. Now we're confronted with some new big facts in this post-war world. I don't intend in the time I'll speak uh, to this convention and rehashing all of the arguments which have been pretty thoroughly covered in the internal bulletins, giving the underlying, in Comrade Hansen's document and Comrade Pablo's and my own, giving our underlying explanations and reasons why we uh, said th uh, those states in Eastern Europe, those satellite states, were in no sense capitalist, but were of the same class type as the USSR. I want to here deal with, uh, 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 extend a few of the uh, conclusions that must be drawn from our appreciation of this new world we're living in, in the, the new world in the sense of the transformations that have occurred since the Second World War. We have big fact number one, the startling weakening of imperialism by the wrenching of whole vast sections of the globe from out of its grip. In addition to the one-sixth of the world that has been wrenched out of imperialism's hold by the October Revolution, we have today imperialism's grip wrenched in the case of China, in the case of the satellite countries, which comprise uh, roughly some half of Europe. And we have these degenerated, bastardized forms of development occurring because while the objective situation is rotten ripe ten times over, for this revolutionary transformation, the subjective uh, factor has lagged behind so badly by the weakness of the Fourth International, the continued influence of Stalinism, which necessarily puts its imprint in the first period of the revolutionary transformations on all sectors of the labor movement and all, uh, and all uh, uh, signs of change which it has power over and which it has influence over. Now, Stalinism, today I don't think it's so startling anymore to say in the discussion, is a unique labor bureaucracy. It has similarities with all previous labor bureaucracies that we have known, but it's not the same. It's different. It's similar to the social democratic labor bureaucracy in many, many instances. But it's not exactly a reformist bureaucracy in the sense that uh, we have known uh, uh, social democracy, in we whether in classic or degenerated form. It's different because it has demonstrated, for one, that under certain unique circumstances, it, could not, it can not only do battle with the bourgeoisie in the sense of leading, taking the leadership of a vast mass movement, which social democracy can do also, but that it can crush that bourgeoisie as it has done in China. Nobody uh, that uh, looks at this 
sorrowful, sinful world we live in can deny what has happened there. The Johnsonites aren't interested in it. They're not interested in this living world, so it's no special surprise. And take political power, leaving aside for the moment uh, uh, the class character of China, which I'll say a word on later on in the discussion. In that sense, they are unlike the traditional reformist labor bureaucracy, which under no circumstances showed its ability, regardless of how stormy the movement that it uh, was forced to lead, it never showed the ability of breaking the old state structure and taking power under a new uh, structure, under a new form and with new forces based on different class formations. Now, Stalinism, as we know, has gone through many evolutionary changes in its uh, 25 odd years of existence. Like all living formations, it has been subjected to the various pressures of conflicting forces and the influences uh, at every given time of the labor movement. What has always been Stalinism, even less than reformism, has any definite social philosophy. They can be the wildest, most adventuristic leftists. They can be the most fantastic opportunists and uh, class collaborationists. The constant always in Stalinism has been its determination to control the labor movement and to utilize it for its own narrow aims and purposes in the USSR for the preservation of the power and the privileges of the oligarchy that uh, uh, rules uh, in, uh, uh, there. And now we see a change that has occurred in Stalinism, although it really isn't Stalinism because that change has occurred. In the process of these vast changes in the post-war world, we have seen first a Communist Party break away as an entity. We have always uh, uh, taken into consideration, and the old man has written many times about breaking, uh, breakaways of Stalinist movements. We always conceived of it more in the nature of splits occurring inside of Communist parties breaking away as an entity with the old Stalinist leadership, transforming itself into a new type of left-centrist leadership in the process of the transformation of its party and its movement. We've seen a party in China where information is still scanty and we cannot say too much definitively on that score of undoubtedly a loosening of the bonds with the Kremlin and the development of a party which has state power and is forced to institute great changes in the social life and structure of that vast country and still riding on top of this great vast upheaval which uh, surely historians will put down as probably the greatest event in our lifetime that has thus far occurred uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Uh, my time is up, and I want uh, a little bit of extension of time, if I may have it. Any objection? Okay. I don't know. It won't, I'll make it as short as I can. I got to answer them. I got to... Marcy, I got to... Can't blame me for all that, can you? Now, our big task, from the point of view of strategic objectives, our movement has to identify itself with all these great progressive movements that are starting in the world, and which for the moment are under the leaderships of Stalinists or near Stalinists. And we have to consider all of these as parts of the process of the world revolution. And by that I include the Yugoslav revolution, 
where, where it's far more clearer to all of us because the break with the Kremlin has been over. I include identifying ourselves with the progressive measures that have been taken in Eastern Europe and of course this great revolution in China which is still in progress and uh, which for the moment is still led by the Chinese uh, Stalinist leadership. We do that and we have to do that should, because we go on the perspective and certainty that sooner or later this vast process of mass upheaval and, va and mass change which represents the first stages here of the world revolution in the post-war uh, epoch will rise high enough, the tide will get great enough where it will sweep over the heads of the bureaucracy and permit the uh, organization of a new leadership through whatever processes and vicissitudes which will able to give authentic voice and which will be able to begin redirecting the whole uh, vast movement along more classic and uh, Bolshevik channels uh, along the general lines and in the, with the general strategy of the 1917 uh, October Revolution. Now, the question is not so paramount today it was asked in slightly modified form by all, by many people before of us. This conundrum that the Johnsonites posed here uh, this afternoon and which I first uh, was confronted with in Detroit. How can the grave diggers of a revolution be leading a revolution? Well, there, this is a typical example of people who get themselves entrapped in a formula which they don't understand to boot and feel completely satisfied with the straitjacket that they have put on themselves and don't feel any necessity even of reconsidering or thinking what's the relation of the formula to reality. China, which is going through a vast upheaval, what's going on there? No answer, no feeling of a necessity for an answer because a vast upheaval of 450 million people is less important than a formula which they don't understand into the bargain. Uh, you might ask, how can counter-revolutionists, which Stalinists are, lead strikes in America, often very militant strikes, and very often lead them to victory, or sometimes lead them to victory? Of course, the answer to the conundrum is that Stalinism, and this is, we don't need any new revelation for that. The old man has completely laid out his analysis of Stalinism correctly for us, which explains that. Stalinism is a contradictory phenomenon which utilizes struggles. It doesn't oppose all struggles. It's not a counter-revolutionary force in the sense of, black, of uh, the Black Legion or in the sense of the White Guards in old Russia or in the sense of a fascist movement. It's a contradictory labor bureaucracy. It utilizes struggles. It assumes the leadership of struggles. It doesn't always betray incidental struggles even when it happens to suit its blackmailing purposes but it always utilizes these with two paramount uh, thoughts in mind which always govern as constants of its policy. One, that it must have the dictatorial power over this struggle and labor movement. And two, that it can only visual, so, uh, to complete that thought, so that it can, will never permit it to rise to any levels which will challenge its own unquestioned might and dictatorship over the labor movement. And two, that it views all these struggles always simply as small change, as checkerboard pawns for its fundamental aim, which is to get concessions or drive back capitalist aggression against themselves for the preservation of their own power and privileges in their own domain in the USSR. And that's why you seek the 
contradiction, which is not one of logic, but the, contradic the contradictory formation of life, where a group of counter-revolutionary counter organization always leads great militant struggles. We have co been confronted with that time and again in America, and now it has risen to these great heights where it has fallen into the leadership of a great revolution. But as Stalinists, they always view these, uh, uh, this influence over the labor movement along the lines I have indicated. And so life itself there solves uh, the problem for us and, show, and at the same time shows how we're dealing with a contradictory formation which has to be understood in its two-sided uh, uh, makeup. You just let me ride along and I'll do the best I can with the tools I got. I'm not going to take more than five minutes or six. Uh, put it up to the body if you wish. But how much, you know, how much, the point is this now. This convention decided for ten minutes limitation of speech from the floor. That was your decision. Now it's up to you what you want to do with it. I think you should live within it. Uh, you see, if you want I, to extend the time to come and come with it, seventeen say, and a half minutes now. If I may say an explanation. Uh, I uh, I believe I'm entitled to a few extra minutes because I have uh, the special views on Eastern Europe that I have to say something about. I have to say a word or two on uh, the a difference between us and the Marcy policy, which has been enunciated. Otherwise, it was hardly worth, uh, there was no point in speaking. No, it's not me who's objecting. I'm just trying to uphold the system of the convention. Uh, let's have a... Go ahead. Now, Comrade, Comrade uh, Weiss's suggestion that the East European states, while capitalism has been wiped out there and they're now part or seem to be becoming part of the USSR but he does not believe that the term worker state applies correctly as in his mind that means that the state originated with a classic revolution I believe narrows down the difference to pretty much uh, where it becomes a terminological one, or you might even go so far as to say a quibble. The basic thing that I saw of importance, when, and those comrades whose views coincided with mine when we proposed opening the discussion on this score, was that these these states in Eastern Europe were of the same class type as that of the USSR. And because of that, our tactical line would have to be governed very similarly to the tactical line we employ in the USSR without going through its various uh, uh, sec uh, sections. And once that is agreed upon, then our tactical line coincides from our appreciation that we're dealing with the USSR forms of class types and not uh, capitalism. And uh, what remains of uh, differences is pretty much of third-rate character. I don't even know whether they're worth too much uh, debate or discussion. In one sense, you can say if this will make com uh, Comrade Weiss or others any happier about it, in one sense, you can say that they have been integrated into the state structure of the USSR. But then, of course, you have to add that that integration is of a different type. Of a, it's a different integration than was the case of Eastern Poland or uh, the Baltics or the exist the Ukraine uh, as part of the USSR and so on. Now, we have... In the World Resolution 
of 1948, the official document stated and spoke that a third world war in the form of an attack of world imperialism under American leadership against the USSR is inevitable if successful socialist revolutions do not materialize in the interim, if the contest between the USSR and world imperialism is confined, however, to military means, the defeat and destruction of the USSR is certain. Now, I believe we already have to bring that section up to date, and we have to say that it's now already clear that the next world war is not going to be fought as a war with purely military means. Look at what happened in Korea as a harbinger of events to come. In a sense, a fight in the Cold War between the two great powers of the world. A civil war in Korea. The civil war uh, uh, measures of a class character introduced in the course of the Civil War to help the military fight along if for no other reason. You can see that the coming war is going to, f from the first day, going to be intertwined in the most immediate way with all kinds of upheavals, uprisings, civil wars, measures introduced of a class character and vast changes to uh, awaken populations and get their enthusiasm behind the, uh, the, uh, one of the military sides. And in that sense, America is going to be confronted from almost the first day of the war, not purely with a military struggle against the USSR, but against the rising civil war and rising class struggles. But here is... <laughs> where the Marcyites are so off the track and so completely wrong, and why the whole, their whole theory, not only is all that it, uh, was stated in the pre previous discussion, but why it doesn't aid us in our revolutionary tasks, but puts the greatest stumbling block in the way. As these civil wars arise, the role of the... Cl you're not going to have them all line up in one of the camps here, against American imperialism and the other camp, but as they rise in every case where they threaten to get out of hand of, uh, of the Kremlin rulers, in every case where they rise independently of the Kremlin squads and agents, the Kremlin forces, as they have demonstrated only too clearly in Yugoslavia, can even at the expense of their struggle with American imperialism, undermine and work to smash and crush movements which militarily they could utilize because their fear of independent movements is even greater than weakening their military front as their whole history has shown in the Second World War and in the events uh, of the aftermath. And that's why, for, if for no other reason, this two-camp schema is the worst blow you can strike at a correct strategic orientation of the revolutionary forces. Because in the germ of truth that the, sec the Third World War is going to be a great upheaval here of civil wars and vast uprisings, they're not going to be in the second camp of the Kremlin. They're not only going to be in a different camp from the Kremlin, but they're going to have to defend themselves, themselves arms in hand against the Kremlin at least as much as they will against the forces of imperialism on the other side. And that's one of the most telltale things as well as your viewing Stalin's depredation and Stalin's imposition of unequal and robber treaties on China as a great progressive act which shows the class affinity between uh, China and the USSR. I view it the other way. I am hoping for the break of the Mei Tung leadership from uh, the Kremlin, as the Tito leadership broke from the Kremlin, and I view the imposition of Robert Treaties as something that's got to be not hailed, but resisted and fought, and one of the great lines of our propaganda to produce a break in China 
between the, the perfidious Kremlin leadership and its role and what it intends to do with the Chinese mass movement and that revolution which for the moment is headed by a leadership of uncertain uh, Stalinist uh, complexion. I'll leave out of the question for the moment of uh, the class character of China, as I'm sure my colleague here, Conrad Hansen, would, is going to take that up and conclude with this. I uh, feel very glad of the whole discussion that we have had since February or a little prior to February, as I believe that it has faster than I had anticipated when we started the discussion, and in a far calmer and more comradely atmosphere than I anticipated would be in the case in, in February as well, has broken through what I consider certain doctrinaire blinders uh, that uh, people were wearing. And we have now been able to bring up to date our basic philosophy so that we are encompassing in it all these great new events of the post-war epoch. And once we did that, I knew it would only take five minutes for us to be able to draw the correct uh, and logical, practical tasks and tactics for our movement to follow, which give us a correct position and an answer of what our role is, how we envisage the next stages of for the growth and the breaking through of the Fourth International, and how we stand on Yugoslavia, and how we stand on China, and how we stand on Bessarabia. And I'm sure after Comrade Murray's remarks, uh, we won't have too much difficulty either in uh, arriving at an agreement on how we stand on Eastern Europe. Uh, comrades, I think everybody recognizes that we have to stretch our rules a little bit to, to serve our main purpose here. Uh, several of the NC comrades uh, generously gave me a part of their time so that I could develop the, the collective thinking on this question that we've been doing this summer uh, in one presentation. The subject under discussion is so vast, so uh, uh, inclusive, and so decisive for the future of our movement that it's literally impossible to cover it in a long report of an hour and a half or even in uh, one discussion of the whole convention. Uh, we'll obviously continue the discussion afterwards. Now, as I see what is taking place in our international movement today, is that a great collective intellectual effort of our in international movement is being brought to bear uh, with increasing intensity upon the new problems that have confronted us, the disciples of Trotsky, ten years after his death. I believe you all know the role that Trotsky played in the construction of our movement. He was the heir of the Russian Revolution. He was the embodiment of its, the history and the practice and the theory of the Marxist movement the formulator of the program which created the cadres of the Fourth International. Uh, when Trotsky was among us, uh, the complicated problems of that time were answered quicker and more surely because of the role that he played. Now, our task as the disciples of Trotsky has been to assimilate ten years of history, which included five years of war and five years of post-war developments without his help, but by means of his method that he taught us. 
the very fact that 10 years after the death of Trotsky, his movement exists and grapples with world problems and tries to find in every one of them the basis for revolutionary action, that in itself is the greatest testimony to the correctness and the revolutionary vitality of the ideas and the method that he gave to us. But our discussion is taking time, taking long, and it had to proceed by stages. You recall that we first had to fight after the uh, end of the World War, we had to fight those who challenged the basic positions of Trotskyism. Uh, some of you young people may not remember, it seems so long ago, that, uh, uh, but we were one time fighting with Moroites over the question of whether Trotskyism was valid anymore. The right wing in France who were in uh, conciliatory toward Stalinism because they were under the pressure of the Stalinist movement here, just like the pitiful Moroites in this country were under the pressure of American imperialism. Then we had to fight the phenomenon of this right wing in the United States and this pro-Stalinist wing in the France in a block trying to break up our international and reduce all its program to trash. And then we had pompous sectarian screwballs like Moon has taken up our time in the first five years of the uh, post-war, of the uh, post-Trotsky effort. All that's been cleared out of the way. And now, the discussion is proceeding among the genuine Trotskyists themselves. That is the orthodox Trotskyists, who are the only Trotskyists there are. And this discussion is a very lively one and a quite different one. From all indications, it's moving rapidly now to solid agreements on all the most important questions. And here's a strange phenomenon in the world today. As far as I can observe, the Trotskyists are the only ones who are discussing the new events that are popping up from month to month. The right-wing revisionists, for the most part, all those who attempted to revise our program in the past 10 years or more, have pretty much gone over in to the camp of imperialism, and they have no more problems to settle. No more discussions are needed. The Shackmanites are not discussing as lively and feverishly as they used to. The only discussion I can observe taking place in their ranks, from what reading I do of their press, is that they got another social patriotic wing, and they're arguing with them in a comradely way as to whether it's quite correct to support the American imperialists in the Korean War and other places. The Shackmanites are great agriculturists. They raise a new crop of social patriots once every year. And I heard that they're improving their uh, fertilizing methods and they're going in for a two-ish two crop a year. I was struck by the fact that the Johnsonites don't want to discuss either. Why? Not from the point of view of the Shackmanites, that they're so far over into the other camp. I don't say all the Shackmanites are uh, social imperialists. I say half of them are already pretty frank imperialists, and the others are neutral in favor of American imperialism. <laughs> now, the Johnsonites don't want to discuss the new events, because they've got all problems solved already in a closed system. That's a very comfortable position to be, to stand, to be able to stand up and say, we will not debate this, we say that, that is not important. After you've done so and so, then we will do so and so. That's all right if you like religion, where you get all problems settled at one shot, and then you don't have to worry and discuss and have any more divisions in your ranks anymore. When you say you are a complete unanimity and you don't have any discussions or difference of opinion among yourselves, that only convinces me that what you've got is not a lively political program subject to various interpretation under the stress of events. You've got a closed dogma. 
I don't like dogmas. I don't like churches or popes. I had one. I got rid of him, and I don't want any more. <laughs> I say the, the best proof of the, of the genuine revolutionary vitality of Trotskyism is that it has all kinds of different points of view. You can see that reflected in our committee. We other camp. I don't say all the Shackmanites are uh, social imperialists. I say half of them are already pretty frank imperialists, and the others are neutral in favor of American imperialism. <laughs> now, the Johnsonites don't want to discuss the new events because they've got all problems solved already in a closed system. That's a very comfortable position to be, to stand, to be able to stand up and say, we will not debate this, we say that, that is not important. After you've done so and so, then we will do so and so. That's all right if you like religion, where you get all problems settled at one shot, and then you don't have to worry and discuss and have any more divisions in your ranks anymore. When you say you are a complete unanimity and you don't have any discussions or difference of opinion among yourselves, that only convinces me that what you've got is not a lively political program subject to various interpretation under the stress of events. You've got a closed dogma. And I don't like dogmas. I don't like churches or popes. I had one. I got rid of him and I don't want any more. I say the, the best proof of the, of the genuine revolutionary vitality of Trotskyism is that it has all kinds of different points of view. You can see that reflected in our committee and in the convention and the international movement. All kinds of different points of view, but when you boil them down, what do they amount? Different understanding of what has happened. Different analysis of facts. Differences as to what is the, the reality and what is not but all aim to the common point of view to find what is the reality and do it honestly and admit facts when they stare you in the face and then try to find in the new reality the basis for revolutionary action. That's why our, some comrades wonder, how can the discussion proceed so, so friendly and so comradely and without even, as far as I know, any uh, serious factional tendencies? Because we're striving to the same goal. And we're trying to use the same method. And I believe we'll reach that goal of a, of a common position. Now, it's not easy, and I say it's impossible for a living political movement that's not an ossified church to answer all these complicated questions at once and with unanimity. Because the world developments are so complicated and so complex, that they require investigation, they require analysis, they require information that we don't always have at hand. The basic factor in the world situation as I see it is that the prognosis of Marxism, that capitalism would come to grief as a result of its own contradictions, that the system would go down, and that it would be replaced by the conscious movement of the masses, which would itself be the product of these uh, ineluctable contradictions. The first half of the Marxist prognosis is being vindicated every, everywhere before our eyes, that the disintegration of capitalism is, ta is taking place at a faster rate than we anticipated, and faster than the conscious movement of the workers has been able to catch up with it. That's what's taking place. But just look, what's, look what has happened if you take just the, the Eastern Europe alone, and Germany, and Italy, in fact, the whole world outside the United States. Only a generation ago after the First World War, the Hungarian bourgeoisie was able to crush the proletarian revolution with its own power. The bourgeoisie of all these eastern countries were able to impose a military police dictatorship on the labor, on the working class and the peasantry with their own powers and only a little help from the bourgeoisie. The German bourgeoisie was able to crush the German revolution with its own power. 
Now that vitality which the bourgeoisie showed in the, in the, uh, in the period of following the First World War is not evident any place today. Nobody will contend for a minute that capitalism could stand up in Europe without the help of the United States economic and military and without the help of the Trotskyists, not even in Italy or France. Now the result of this increasing disintegration of the outlived capitalist system and the failure of the conscious movement of the masses, which we are the representatives, to catch up with these objective developments, that does not stop the developments. It results in bastardized forms of many kinds. But the movement proceeds just the same. You don't get classic revolutions. You don't get perfect worker states. You get all kinds of complicated forms, but underneath it you see powerful movements of the masses, which all break out, apparently out of a clear sky, in, as in China and particularly in Korea. And our problem that confronts us as revolutionists is, shall we observe these events? Or shall we try to understand them and participate in them? That's the difference between the revolutionary approach and the spectator's approach. And if we don't participate in these events and in these struggles, regardless of what leadership they may have at the moment, we will never be able to influence them. That's the central thought at the bottom of all the discussion taking place in our ranks and unfolding with great clarity. Uh, it has been said here many times, repeated again by Comrade de Harry, correctly, that Stalinism is the central question of this period. Certainly it is. And that's because in the absence of a sufficiently strong revolutionary uh, political movement, these irrepressible uprisings of the masses find themselves for the time being under the control or the influence of the leadership of the Stalinists. But that doesn't alter the fact that they are revolutionary movements. That doesn't alter the fact that the masses are not imbued with any desire to work in Stalin's forced labor camps. They want to overthrow the conditions of life which are unbearable for them. And sometimes they push things to the point of taking power. That's what we think happened in Yugoslavia. That's what is the evidence before our eyes. And when uh, fact after fact is piled up before us, this is what happened. It's been verified. There was a civil war. The bourgeoisie was defeated in the civil war. The proletarian brigades defeated the uh, uh, invader, the invading Nazis and the, and the Chetniks. They set up an apparatus of a new state power. They expropriated the bourgeoisie. They smashed the power of the church. They nationalized industry. We say, all these are facts, aren't they? And then somebody says, well, you can't call that a revolution. Why? Because you have a theory that a centrist party cannot lead a revolution. And your theory prohibits you from recognizing the Yugoslav revolution. Well, my answer to that is very simple. I am not nearly as big a trap as you think. My answer is, I don't have any theories that prohibit me from recognizing facts and trying to deal with them. And as a matter of fact, there is no law that I know of to the effect that under certain exceptional conditions, a centrist party cannot find itself at the head of a revolution in its early stages. I know that uh, Marx and after him Engels, or after him Lenin and Trotsky, considered the communists the... Uh, a Paris Commune, a revolution and a dictatorship of the proletariat. Yet in the leadership of the Commune, 
the members of Marx's First International were a small minority, and the Marxists in the uh, Fourth International faction were a minority of that. But that didn't prevent them from saying that that was the first worker state. And that didn't prevent Lenin from analyzing it more profoundly later and saying the reason that the revolution wasn't carried through to success, the decisive reason, in his opinion, was precisely the fact that a revolutionary party was not forged in time to lead it through to victory. I don't consider this a law that under certain conditions the workers can take power without beforehand a party of the Fourth International having gained the leadership of the majority of the working class. I don't consider that a law. I believe on the basis of all the experience from the Russian Revolution through Hungary, and by the way, what is the Hungarian Revolution? I think we always recognized that as a revolution, didn't we? And yet, the power there wasn't taken by a revolutionary party. It was delivered into the hands of the Communist Party by the bourgeoisie when the Communist leaders were in jail and they set up a government in coalition with the Social Democrats in the short-lived Hungarian Revolution. Now, the generalization that Trotsky and others drew from the later experience was that this coalition with the Social Democrats was a fatal error and that, uh, generally speaking, the idea that a reformist or centrist party can lead a revolution against the bourgeoisie through to completion is, is, uh, is not correct. It may start that way because the revolutionary impulses of the masses and the disintegration of the bourgeois power on the other side may proceed at such a rate that the climactic struggle uh, emerges before the revolutionary party is ready. But if the uh, party in power does not follow a revolutionary policy, does not in time get on the revolutionary track and stay there, the revolution can be defeated. Revolution is not, as we understand it, a single act performed on one day, but a long process of getting the power and of keeping it and developing it through the conclusion. Now, when anything like this takes place anywhere, we have to recognize it and participate in it. And that's what we're doing in Yugoslavia. We are not capitulating to the idea that Stalinists can lead a revolution and that therefore we have no historical role to play. I agree entirely with what Harry said, that the uh, Yugoslav Communist Party when it took the power, and by the fact that it did take the power, had broken basically with uh, Stalinism. But we are participating in this revolution right now. By our, by our support on the one hand, by our criticism on the other, we are trying to live up to our responsibility as a revolutionary party responsible for the further development of the Yugoslav revolution. And it's not excluded that we will have success. The criticism, the support, the arguments of the Fourth International are being read by some people in Yugoslavia. They, to a certain extent, perhaps are influenced by them. At any rate, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take our part of the responsibility and by no means abstaining from it. I don't want to repeat at great length what has already been developed here, but it's a fundamental to this understanding of Stalinism. The understanding or misunderstanding of Stalinism is decisive for a revolutionary policy or otherwise. I fully agree with that. And I think what's the trouble with the Stalinophobes of all kinds what rendered them absolutely helpless in the face of revolutionary tasks is they didn't understand Stalinism. That it's not a world monolith. That Stalinism is a Russian nationalist phenomenon primarily. That the world Stalinist movement 
especially when it comes into under the pressure of great masses, and especially when it's confronted with the problems of power, has to break with the Russian Stalinism and therefore ceases to that extent to be Stalin. I was amazed and my hair almost stood on end when I heard this pronouncement from the papal throne here yesterday about Stalinism is the syphilis of the labor movement, the grave digger of the revolution. There are 2,000 Communist Party members in France, 22 and a half million in Italy. Are you going to make a revolution in Italy or France without these two and a half million Stalinist workers or Stalinist sympathizers? And is Stalinism something that gets into one's blood, even the blood of a worker, and he can never cure it? Or is Stalinism simply a misunderstanding as far as the workers are concerned, who think it means revolution and who, when they find out it doesn't mean that, can be converted to a different political uh, organization. On the other side, on the other side, I don't think we should entertain any false ideas as to the role of Stalinism, even the event of a new war. The idea that the, the new war is a worldwide class struggle in which the leadership comes from the Soviet Union is profoundly false. Profoundly false. Uh, Bert made an excellent point yesterday that even in the midst of the war, the revolutionary workers will have to fight Stalinism for their lives. That wherever the workers try to take power into their own hands, even in the midst of the war, they'll have to contend with the military force of the Stalin. In the midst of the war, Stalin will try to sell out any revolution in a deal with the imperialists, rather than let the Yugoslavian example spread widely. Imagine a proletarian revolution in Italy and France in which a genuine worker's power is established. Imagine Stalinism leading that civil war. Oh, that is a monstrous illusion. Stalin's guns will be turned on that war, even in collaboration with the imperialists. I say even, I shouldn't even say even, I should say that's a matter of course, that's the example of the last world war. We know that in the United States, before our very eyes, you even had that in Buffalo, I think, that in the alliance with the American bourgeoisie, they turned everything they had against the American workers' movement. They're not leaders of the class struggle against capitalism. They are defenders of the Soviet bureaucracy and its privileges against the international revolution and to the extent necessary against the bourgeoisie. But they are always willing to compromise with the bourgeoisie, but they're never willing to compromise with the workers. But in, you cannot fight Stalinism by cursing it and turning your back on it. Every place the movement develops under Stalinist influence, as in the Orient, as in Yugoslavia, as in France or Italy or any place else, we can only effectively fight Stalinism by participating in the genuine movement as partisans of the movement, and every inch we succeed in pushing it on a genuine revolutionary path, that's the strongest blow to deal against Stalinism, and that's the way it'll be eventually destroyed. I believe that's the basic thought behind the uh, collective opinion of our international comrades, as well as by the leaders of our party. One remarkable thing comes out of this, uh, this discussion, that in all the world analysis, in the frank confrontation of new facts, unforeseen and unknown, the Trotsky analysis is the only one who sees and, and looks for at every new contradictory development 
the prospects of revolutionary action. That's what we did in Korea. And what a miserable record every other tendency showed. What a miserable record. Abstain in the Korean fight against the American imperialist gangsters and still talk about revolution and, and still talk about fighting Stalinism? No, that's abdication. Here's another remarkable fact. That Trotskyism, which has been accused of capitulating to Stalinism for the last 25 years, Trotskyism is the only set of ideas and methods that's been able to create a revolutionary movement in the world. You know of any other? I don't know of any other. I know of others who made pretensions, but I don't even hear much of the pretensions anymore. But Trotskyism everywhere remained a revolutionary party, didn't capitulate to Stalinism, and did not capitulate to the imperialists either. Now, how is that explained? How is that to be explained that a party who's, who is wrong on the basic political problem of the epoch, the understanding of Stalinism, we're told we're completely wrong on that, and we're wrong on that, we're bound to be wrong on everything. How is it this party was wrong on the basic question and wrong on its understanding of the crisis of leadership, which is the second important question? has nevertheless, in spite of that, been able to create revolutionary parties all over the world and is the only tendency that could do it. I'd like to hear that explanation. And I'd like to see the comrades who give us warnings about the great catastrophe that awaits us. I can have them stop and consider. We heard all these kind of warnings and ultimatums, as Harry said, for the... Ten years or so he's been in the movement, and I heard it for the ten years before that. What happened to all these people who gave us all the warnings about capitulating to Stalinism? As far as I know, every one of them, all the numerous uh, factions and oppositions and split-offs that we had who lost their heads over Stalinism, they all became at the very least bankrupt when it comes to dealing with living events. Nothing to say, no intervention in Yugoslavia, no recognition of the tremendous upheaval taking place in China, and no idea of participating in it. Not even, not even a positive line on the classic action in Korea, which was real test for everybody with a semblance of revolutionary realism. All we see from all other tendencies has been either abstention or support of imperialism. Everybody that went crazy on Stalinism either became an abstentionist or a capitulator to imperialism. The latest detachment is read the Shackmanite press in their national committee. They got a faction which calmly proposes to support American imperialism in its war for the liberation of the Korean people. And the others abstain. We, on the other hand, have an active policy of intervention. And I'll admit we have been late with some of our answers. We've been late in recognizing reality. But I think we're beginning to catch up. And we mustn't permit ourselves any more tardiness. And I don't believe we will need to. Because the because the thought of the international is merging toward a, a, uh, a general agreement and is guarding itself against uh, useless fights over uh, terminological distinctions, as has been stated here. Great work has been done. I mention this only because uh, the bugaboo that has been given to us uh, in uh, in the documents of the Johnsonites about Pablo. Next to Stalin, our greatest thing to fear is Pablo, they tell us. Uh, that bugaboo doesn't scare me in the least. I just want to make that clear. As far as I can judge, and I read everything with the greatest attention, the best thinking, the boldest and clearest thinking that has been done with the complicated problems of the post-war area 
area have been led, in my opinion, by Pablo. But I'm not, I don't belong to any Pablo church, and I don't agree with him on every point. I disagree with his unfortunate expression about centuries of degenerated worker states. You'll have to correct that. I disagree with him when he said something, used the unfortunate expression about the impossibility of a war in the near future. Uh, well, we disagree, we'll make it clear, but I'm speaking about the method of thinking, the attempt to recognize the new reality with open eyes and try to see in that new developing reality the basis not for a capitulation for, against Stalinism, but for a new struggle against it. I believe we're more effective against, in the struggle against Stalinism if we proceed that way than if we turn our backs and abstain, wash our hands of the whole nasty business. I would like to conclude by, by one warning to the comrades from Buffalo. I don't believe that Comrade Marcy is in any sense at all a Stalinist co conciliator. I don't believe that. But I believe the theory he's propounding can influence less sturdy people in that direction. I think his theory has got to be radically changed. They got to give up the idea that all the thinking on the international problems is being done in Buffalo. It's being done on a worldwide scale, and we got to learn from each other. And woe to the man who will not learn. Woe to the stubborn. Nobody can prevent being in error now and then. Nobody can prevent mistakes, but the man who gets stubborn in his mistakes and persists in them, he's in a bad way. I hope that as a result of the discussion and the convention and the subsequent discussion, that all comrades will learn from each other and we'll have emerging, a real collective thinking of the great problems resulting in a general agreement fully in line with the great traditions and principles of our movement. I want to thank those who have made it possible for me to speak at this convention. I am grateful to them. I shall spend a few minutes discussing what we take up in the section of our bulletin on the theory of the party. We did not make it clear enough in this bulletin, even to some of the comrades of our tendency. Note, please, that I am saying this with regard to the theory of the party. On the question of the program of the party, the need of a program for the party, there has been no doubt or uncertainty where we stand. From the beginning of the discussion and at the beginning of our document, we made this clear. And Comrade Monin has said, all that needs to be said for us on this. Nor are we introducing new ideas as to how the Socialist Workers' Party is to be built. We are not saying that the leadership is giving a wrong line or following a wrong tactic on this or any other question. That is not our theory nor our practice. And I think I can safely say that the comrades know that that is neither our theory or our practice. In this section on the theory of the party, we were pointing out that the Stalinists, the whole gigantic state apparatus of Stalinism and of world Stalinism, are propagating a special theory of the party. It is propagated in every field, political economy, philosophy, art, literature, in political practice, and in political theory, in book after book, pamphlet after pamphlet, day in and day out. But you don't have to read these books and pamphlets 
to be aware of the Stalinist theory of the party. Not at all. Every worker is aware of, and the general public is aware, and interested in this theory of the party. The Stalinist theory of the one-party bureaucratic state. And we were saying that we, we the Revolutionary Party, have to oppose that conception. Now here we broke new ground. We want to say that frankly. What we were trying to say in that section was this. Today, bureaucracy is the fundamental form of capitalism. The result is that the labor movement, which becomes corrupted by capitalism, takes on that form and becomes completely bureaucratized. The two parties that we, the Revolutionary Party, have to fight, for whose overthrow we have to prepare, the Social Democracy and the Stalinists, are distinguished by the fact that they consciously aim at imposing bureaucratic domination over the working class. That is the Stalinist conception of the party in particular. They have not got the Leninist conception any longer or any adaptation of it. They mean totalitarian, one-party, bureaucratic domination. And they say... And we believe that our theory of the party should be such that whoever reads it will be able to say this. I do not know too much about Trotskyism. I do not believe in communism at all. But it is perfectly clear from what these Trotskyists say that they have a totally different conception of the party and the role of the party from that which the Stalinists have. We say that many people and I know this from personal experience, say that the difference between us and the Stalinists is that we claim we would be democratic while the Stalinists are totalitarian. Note, I am not talking of democracy in our party here. I am speaking of democracy when the power is seized. And we try to say that it is not a question of they, the Stalinists, being undemocratic while we, the Trotskyists, are democratic. It is a question of social struggles, of social functions, of a whole social formation at this stage of capitalism, and of the role of the masses in that. And we say also that this is extremely clear in Comrade Trotsky's conception of the Labor Party. That is all that I have to say on this. I am speaking here briefly and simply for the purposes of clarification. Comrade Chairman and Comrades, Comrade Cannon, in his speech, fixed the uh, source of the undoubted confusion and doubts in the minds of many comrades on the fact that there are some who believe that a centrist party cannot lead a proletarian revolution. I hope he is correct, because in that case we shall have no difficulties. To help clear up that particular aspect of the confusion, I want to say that at no time, either in discussions in the committee or in my presentation, that I ever want to have any comrade get the idea that a centrist party that evolves even from underneath the leaden lid of Stalinism can lead a revolution. I'm afraid that the real source of the confusion goes much deeper. The confusion you refer to, I think, can be cleared up very simply. I think it arises from the fact that the formula that you propose to characterize the events in Yugoslavia does not set the limits to what a centrist movement can accomplish and cannot. It arises from the undoubted self-contradiction 
of a proletarian revolution unfolding for which we take complete responsibility, in which we seek to participate in every possible way we can, which we support unconditionally, led by a leadership for which we take no political responsibility. We take no political responsibility not only for the Yugoslav Communist Party and its policies, we take no responsibility for the policies of the Yugoslav regime. Isn't that so? Now what does that mean? That regime now appears as the work, as the comrades want to say, an expression of the worker state. And that's the trouble, that's the whole trouble. Set limits to what such a leadership can do because we're in complete agreement that the continuation of these policies can only lead to destruction. The limits of such a leadership must be recognized in your formula characterizing the stage of the process which the proletarian revolution has reached. What are these limits? In my opinion, and here I am condensing the differences as, as, as uh, clearly as I am able, such a regime can only set up a succession of dual power systems in its leadership of the proletarian revolution. That is to say, continue a condition of social crisis which can be eliminated by the only historic and necessary guarantee. And what is that? What is that guarantee? That guarantee is the leadership and the policy which the Russian Revolution had. That is to say, the guarantee which only the Trotskyist movement can give. Now, there's no disagreement on this. In the resolution itself, we characterize the party as centrist and propose no change in that, I am sure. Four more minutes, good. Now, I wish also I could agree with the conception that if we adopt the formula of the worker state, that would somehow enable us to intervene more actively, push that revolution forward, guarantee its success. I say I wish I could believe it because that would be so easy. That would be so good. That would be really a weapon in our hands. But you've had the practice of experience already. The international movement and our own movement has been treating that in terms of the dictatorship of the proletariat, has been treating that in terms of a victorious proletarian revolution. And yet, what do we find in the recent period? We find ourselves not only coming to, but actually in the sharpest collision politically with precisely that regime. And we explain, and, I, and mind you, comrades, I think we have been too sharp. We have been too sharp in our criticisms because we're not only addressing the regime, we're addressing the mass of the people, the revolutionists, to follow that regime. We can't come to them and say, your system will die. We've got to come to them with the truth. We'll say you want to protect the conquests of your revolution, which is also ours, which we want, we're going to defend to the death with you. Look at the policies that are followed. These are not correct policies. These policies are necessary. They're historically necessary. They're politically necessary. They're a life and death question. Look at the experience of your own leadership, and so forth and so on. Now, I hope I have made my uh, point clear enough. I don't think I should take the time of the convention any further. The aim of this entire discussion is precisely to do what Comrade Cannon put so plain. Intervene. In that discussion, he saw no serious threat of faction. I didn't see any threat at all. I was surprised that only a very small number of comments even suggested that the elections in their branches should take place on the basis of the 
different motivations. To prevent that possibility, I did not introduce a counter-resolution. They don't need methods of warfare to settle disagreements in our movement. We need entirely different forms. We don't need to set up systems of dual power inside our own pot, create conditions of crisis. There is no crisis in our pot, nor in the international, and there won't be. Precisely because of that, I presented my point of view as a memorandum. And precisely because of that, I propose to follow the following course, to avert any possible idea that any government may have, that I personally will lead any faction on disagreements concerning the actual phase of the revolution, how we can best intervene. Anybody has any such idea? Forget it. And those contemptible people who have the nerve to get up and say, psychologically analyze it as a fear to be in a minority. I not only resent that, I tell you, I spit in your face. I propose that the, those comrades who agree with the views I've presented, that they abstain with the memorandum. That's not abstentionism in their sense at all. We don't want to vote no. A no vote is a vote of no confidence in the leadership. Why Any confidence? I believe that in all our actions, we must be responsible above all for the course of our part. And that's why I propose to follow the method I have uh, just outlined to you. John Murray. Comrades, I think it was a very good discussion on related questions in Yugoslavia. It was essential that the convention start the discussion that we had here, or at least raise the discussion that we've had over the last period to a new point. From different points of view, sometimes from fundamentally different points of view, comrades have said that the main question is Stalinism. But from the point of view of all the Trotskyists, the question of Stalinism is the question of the destruction, the breakup, the annihilation of Stalinism. We don't make any split between our evaluation and our task. As we deepen our evaluation and grapple with every new form of the reality, it is constantly intertwined for us with new forms of struggle. The suggestion that the problem before us is to understand Stalinism or to make some declaration on Stalinism, a subject which we have concealed our views upon, is of course ludicrous. And I'll deal with that, although many speakers have adequately taken up that point. Our comrade Bert, I thought, made a very interesting point in his discussion. He said that by and large, we are narrowing down the difference to a terminological one or even to a quibble. He said he understands that by our recent discussion, we are coming to agreement that what is involved is the integration, assimilation, or any other word you want to use of this area into the Soviet or into the Russian structure. That's been the method, it seems to me, of all the comrades internationally, aside from all the by points in the discussion, 
in attempting to evaluate Eastern Poland, Eastern uh, Europe. That's the nature of the process. We have guarded carefully against attempting to construct a whole new evaluation of Stalinism, an entire epoch, a qualitative difference upon the basis of the phenomena in Eastern Europe. An altogether different argument is with the Johnsonites, who enter the discussion on the buffer zone precisely with that motivation. In effect, what they're saying is, if the Kremlin is capable, through bureaucratic and military methods, of seizing territory after it's made a deal with imperialism at the expense of the working class, and by bureaucratic military methods incorporating areas into the Soviet Union, then you have granted, they tell us, a new quality to Stalinism, and then what is the role of the Fourth International? We reject that whole approach to the question, and that's the basic point with regard to Eastern Europe. To then attempt to imply that we are setting up a series of exceptions is to not understand that reality does not conform to very simple and even simple-minded formulas. This is not the first time we witness this complex refraction of historical laws, the nature of certain phenomena in real history. There is no reason whatsoever, and this was the shading of our dispute, it seems to me, in America and in the worldwide discussion up to now. There's no reason whatsoever on the basis of the phenomena of Eastern Europe to construct a qualitatively new analysis of Stalinism. It doesn't relieve us of the problem of facing each and every question, exceptional questions, from this central standpoint. Now, Comrade Burt, in his reference to the riddle, I can't pronounce that other word, conundrum, the riddle that the uh, Johnsonites pose about what is the role of the Fourth International, gave a very good answer. I think he explained better than I did just exactly what our approach is to the question. By the same token, I would ask all those comrades who participated in this discussion with us what fundamental differences or even what secondary differences remain between us. If that's settled, if it's settled that we're not dealing with a qualitative distinction, that Eastern Europe represents a manifestation of bureaucratic military action of the Stalinists and not some new mode of revolution, fundamentally new. And I think we can work out the question and further discussion, pay attention to all details and all facts. And I think we'll have a deepening of this atmosphere in the discussion of scientific, detached concern for the truth facing every question that arises. I'd like to ask the comments of the Johnson Forrest tendency. Whom did you debate with in your document? You got everything turned around. It would appear that we have never said a word on Stalinism, whereas in our conception, our whole movement was founded and has developed precisely in the evaluation, analysis, and struggle against Stalin. After a certain period in the party, you present a proposal that we do away with the whole conception that our movement has developed 
about Stalinism for a number of reasons. Central among these is that we now have to understand the whole world that we live in from the standpoint of the theory of state capitalism. We then propose to take up your challenge to our program, which doesn't have to be written for the first time, and suddenly you aren't there. Now, I never had a pope to get rid of, so perhaps I don't have the, the passion on this question. Carmen Cannon has. But I, too, am very irritated with this hide-and-seek method in the discussion. Perhaps they listen too carefully to one of the most famous mixed metaphors ever pronounced at our conventions. And I think on the trade union report, one of our comrades said, when you get into hot water, either unfurl your banner or pull in your arms. <laughs> I think that the comrade should have added, don't try doing all three things at once. <laughs> I also object to this, to this method of uh, <coughs> implying that there's some undelineated wisdom yet to come. That uh, you have to go on to the most the more uh, esoteric documents. That's not just for any old discussion like at a national convention. Uh, we'll bide our time. I had sympathy with a karma to express the feeling that he would feel happier about this process if uh, it was really working out that way in the party. But it not only irritates, it infuriates comrades who have been trained in the program and method of our movement to suddenly find that among the youth of the party, there are those who have gone through a basic training course in state capitalism before they have even begun to approach the fundamental documents and methods of Trotskyism. And there is even no discussing with them. And they got all the tactics and strategy of the substantialism in the discussion, all down pat. That doesn't make for the approach that sometime in the future we will discuss these basic questions. I incidentally owe an apology to the Los Angeles Johnson Forest comrades, so I thought that was a local quirk on their part. We uh, came into the pre-convention discussion with the disposition to start with the fundamental questions as we have been taught. Yes, philosophy, political economy, historical materialism, the nature of the epoch, the nature of the party, the nature of Stalinism, imperialism. As we were rather grateful that these fundamental questions were posed. And when we open the discussion on these points under one heading or another, the comrades said, why are provoking? It's provocation. We want to discuss program. And one comrade very aptly said, why, well, that reminds us of the Shackmanites in 1940. In the face of differences which were rooted in theoretical propositions and had to be resolved on the basis of theoretical propositions. You can't take up, as Comrade Frederick says, in total contradiction to the whole procedure, secondary question. And the nature of Stalinism, incidentally, is not the fundamental question with you. That's a derivative question also. If we discuss with you for two days the nature of Stalinism, we'd still have to go into the whole nature of the epoch, classes, what a bureaucracy is. I think it would be better to come off it and to discuss the questions that have been posed in their most fundamental essence. I personally believe the movement will gain by it. And we'll begin to see daylight in this problem only through such a discussion. 
Well, I think Comrade Cannon has already touched on the Pablo question. It seems to be the clever strategy in this discussion to say, you're rushing into the arms of Pablo. That's supposed to frighten. In Los Angeles, I told the comrades that after two or three meetings on his rushing into the arms of Pablo, <clears throat> I told him, why, I'm in the arms of Pablo already. Let's get started from there. <laughs> we don't see any distinction or any fundamental distinction between our thinking and Pablo's. I personally think there's been a lot of distortion about Comrade Pablo's point of view, even on disputed questions. I don't like this shorthand quotation method which says Pablo speaks about centuries of degenerated worker states. As I understand it, and I've reread and read the quotation involved, Amrit Pablo seems to me in an entirely unexpected way, and on a question which certainly can be debated, and I disagree with him, speaks about the period of transition from capitalism to socialism, which may last centuries, and then speaks about that in this period we will witness the appearance of deformed worker states, not corresponding to the norm. That's a disputable question, but to shorten that to say we're going to have centuries of degenerated worker states, I don't think that's a fair presentation of a comrade's point of view. Now, another thing with regard to this method of the Johnson Forest tendency, they said in the discussion here, they repeated what they said in their document, that if it was merely a question of defeatism or defensism on Russia, they wouldn't bother with the problem. Why? Because that's something we can't do very much about. I think this reveals the whole method of this tendency. Defeatism or defensism on the Russian question, or on the Yugoslav question, or on the Korean question. That's the question of the class line of the party in all the unfolding events. That's the question of what our struggle will be, what our intervention will be, what the class nature of that intervention of the party will be. And to discount that question is insignificant because we don't know of how large the Russian Trotskyist movement is, apparently that's the point, the worst empiricism. <clears throat> now I listened very carefully and with great interest to what Comrade Rhea Stone had to say <clears throat> about the theory of the party. I don't think she does justice to her documents, to the document of the Johnson Farr's tendency. Now, if that was the question involved that we have to explain more popularly and more clearly to workers who are frightened and alarmed by the Stalinist conception of a party, why well, we can settle that in five minutes, talk to the, the editors of our press and work out a better line on it. But is that what's involved in your theory of the party? You tell us what the Stalinist conception is, you mentioned the Leninist conception, which is ours. What is your conception? Do you forget the long passages in your document in which you say the first international had its conception of the party, second had its conception, the third a different one, and the fourth must now have a new one? Do you forget the references regarding the enlarging the concept of the party? We have studied that carefully, and it appears to us that you're dealing with a negation of the whole Bolshevik conception of the party, particularly when you state so point blank that the whole cornerstone of our approach, as contained in the transitional program, is exactly the opposite of the truth. And finally, I would like to say to the Johnson Forest Commons that I was disappointed that I didn't hear at least a half a word about the export and import business. 
because it's most interesting as you look into the question a little closer that this glaring contradiction in this, this total conception of the world remains without an answer. It isn't simply that one country was left off the list. Some comrade pointed out to me, I think it was Joe, that the United States has three-fourths of the world's capital and two-thirds of its industrial plant. You're not dealing with a little corner of the earth. If the fundamental driving force of the imperialist epoch is expressed with such force in the United States, where does the whole thesis stand on the new stage of capitalism, which in this particular question has already revealed an entirely different form, not export, not excess of capital, shortage of capital, import. How can we understand the dynamics of American imperialism? its whole perspective in world economy, and its military drive, its role in Europe. How can we understand that pivotal question? The relationship between Europe and America, or America and the whole world for that matter, if we are blind on this central point. <clears throat> now I come to the question of Yugoslavia. I think that the, the main point I want to deal with those are concerned, those comrades, and I think there are very many in the party who have hesitations and doubts, and many questions about Yugoslavia and our characterization. I think the, the central question they ask, I'm talking about Comrade Wright, who in his final remarks just did away with that question, the central question they ask is how come that a centrist party led a workers' revolution to power? I got a note from some of the comrades which posed it point blank. They say, if you contend that the leadership the question of proletarian leadership is the main problem. How do you square this with Yugoslavia or the Yugoslav revolution being led by a non-Bolshevik and non-Trotskyist party seize the power and establish the workers' state? The remarks of Comrade Cannon, I think, introduce the essence of our approach to this question. I was reminded of the opposite formulation of this question in our dispute with the Maroites, where they said there are no revolutionary situations in Europe. <clears throat> Why? Because there is no revolutionary party. Without a revolutionary party, you can't have a revolutionary situation. They, too, made the fundamental mistake. Archive their fundamental statements from the entire process and its movement in history or in economics are absolutely not understandable if you attempt to reverse them in that static form. When we sum up the whole epoch that we have lived in by saying that without a revolutionary world party, the victory of the world proletarian revolution or the victory of the revolution in any given country is not possible, I don't think we have to retreat one inch on that. But we have to understand not a vulgar interpretation of that law. The Paris Commune example is not unimportant because it contains both aspects of the problem, both how a working class in its infancy could arrive at power without the conscious factor being present in full force, or even without it being present to any great degree, and how it falls because of the same reason. In Yugoslavia today, your question about a centrist party 
taking the power is being answered in life and in struggle in this manner without a revolutionary party that understands fundamentally Bolshevism the recent right swing in foreign policy is an indication there can be no successful revolution just as we cannot freeze the revolution to a single date in Yugoslavia so can we unravel and freeze each separate stage of the revolution inclusive of tomorrow. This whole process in which you have a complicated interrelation between the, the party and the masses, the subjective and objective factors, are being worked out.